I want to do something tonight that I hope you'll find interesting, and that is look at some things about the Bible, about the Word of God. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. Before I do, let's read from Psalm 12 and verse 6. The words, plural, of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Let's pray. Lord, we're sure thankful to be here tonight. I just pray, Lord, that you would show us the wonder of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Most, if not all of us here tonight, believe that we have God's word in our hands. We believe that God has given us his word. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But we go beyond that because we also believe that the Bible, the King James Bible, is perfect. And we don't have time tonight, nor is it my intent, to go through the numerous reasons why that's the case with the King James Bible, but it is. It's perfect. We don't believe it has one error. We don't believe it has one contradiction. We don't believe that using the Greek would give us one ounce of more light or insight than what we have right now. We don't believe another version would give us a better rendering of a particular verse or a certain word. If that's the case, I'm stuck because I don't know the first thing about Greek and I don't know how in the world you would determine what needs a better rendering and what doesn't. Some people say, and I'm not being critical of it, but, you know, well, yeah. (laughs) Some people say the King James is good, but this version has a better rendering. Somebody else will say, yes, the King James is good, but I think this version has a better rendering. And then sometimes they'll say the version that they're using needs a better rendering. Wouldn't you be afraid to say something like that about God's Word? I honestly would be. Because one way we refer to the Bible is by calling it the Word of God. Not the Word of God and man, the Word of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, how is it a discerner? We're talking about a book. How is it able to distinguish, to discover, to have knowledge of? Well, because of the word quick. It says, the word of God is quick. That is, it's alive. It's yes. living. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that Jesus is going to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. Right. Something dead can't discern, something living can. Right. So we see the Bible is a living book because it's the word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 says, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So because it's the living word of God, we simply believe that it's absolutely perfect and absolutely pure. We trust what God has said in Psalm 12. We believe Psalm 19, where it says the law of the Lord is perfect. Proverbs 30, every word of God is pure. That's what we believe. That's what we trust. We believe the Bible so perfect and so supreme that God has magnified it above all his name, like he said in Psalm 138 too. Now, I don't say those things to get people to say amen, although we should. And I don't say those things to take a shot at people who use other versions and go to the Greek, though there's times when there's reason to take a shot. I say them because you would think that believing there's one Bible that is perfect would be a normal, common thing to believe. You would think that would be a reasonable, rational thing to adhere to, especially among Christians. But it's not, according to most people. It's actually an uncommon and minority position to have. Most people would tell you that it's an unreasonable or extreme, maybe even a fanatical thing to believe. I mean, go tell a family member or somebody that you know who says they're a Christian and goes to church regularly that you believe there's one Bible that's absolutely perfect. They'll have something to say. Now, some of you may remember the last time I was up here, I gave the results of a questionnaire that I did in which I asked 200 people 
ten spiritual questions. And some of the questions had to do with the Bible. Is the Bible perfect, with no errors, no contradictions? Is the Bible the Word of God? Have you ever read it, cover to cover, every word? Many of them said it was not perfect. It was written by men. Most of them said it in some way or another had errors in it. They, they weren't sure where they were or how, but they believed that it was not perfect. But the thing is, and all of them said they were Christians, every one of them, but over 80% of the people said they have never read it, even though every person except one told me they had a Bible. So what does that tell us? They're being persuaded. And the problem is, more and more, that persuasion is coming from inside the church and not just outside of it where the atheists and the infidels are, but it's coming from inside. Now, how do we answer these people? Does the Bible have errors in it, like so many people say? Was the Bible written by men, or is it written by God? How do we know God wrote it? People say, well, you just have to believe, you just have to have faith. Absolutely. But that's not persuasive enough. That's not convincing enough. Well, tonight, here are, some, here are a few remarkable things about the Bible, things that make it a divine book and one which couldn't possibly have been written by men. There are truths that have been passed down through the years, passed down through the ages, but not nearly to enough people. And there's not nearly enough people desiring to know these things and go find these things out. Because if more people knew some of these things, they would believe the Bible and not belittle it. They would desire it instead of disregarding it and denying it. Now, there's tons of amazing things that we can look at about the Bible. I've just picked a few, and there's no real order to them. There's no real sequence. First of all, let's look at some basic facts about the Bible. A guy recently told me that the Bible was just written by men, and you can't, you can't rely on it. And he was nice about it, and we had a nice long conversation. But he said it was just written by men. You can't rely on it. And I said, well, have you ever read it? And he said, no. I said, well, tell me, why do you think it was written by men? And he kind of hemmed and hawed, and he said, well, it was, it was written by different people, and you know, it was, uh, they wrote in different languages and, and at different times. And how can it be accurate? Is he right? He's right. And that's what I said. I said, well, you're right, but that's not all. Not only that, and I went on to tell him some of these things we're going to go through, because here's what, what, here's what many people don't understand. The Bible was written and compiled over many, many centuries, like 15, 1,600 years. And during that time, God used about 40 different men to write it. They were men, for the most part, who didn't know each other and who had all kinds of different backgrounds and occupations. They were farmers and fishermen and prophets and soldiers and tax collector and a physician. They were guys who had different levels of education and learning, who wrote from different locations, and they used different styles of writing. What were they? There was a history and prophecy and poetry. There's an autobiography. There's symbolic form and doctrinal form, all different kinds. And what did they do? They wrote 66 books that are actually one book, that doesn't have one error in it, that never ever contradicts, and that has never been proven wrong, though many brilliant people have tried to prove it wrong. But the amazing thing, instead, it complements and builds on itself, and it all fits together in a perfect unity. This ties in with that, that matches this, this answers that, and it all comes together perfectly. How can that be? Because they're not the authors. God is. And we can't get into inspiration tonight except to say all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They weren't guys sitting around trying to decide what to write and what to say next like they were writing a research paper for college. They knew exactly what to say because God spoke through them and they recorded every word that God wanted recorded. Men wrote the Bible. I mean, are you kidding? Those guys, they were writing about the creation of the world. 
They were writing about the fall and redemption of man. They were writing about things like justification and sanctification and propitiation and glorification. Deep, heavy words. They were writing about the attributes of God. About future events in great detail. Things they couldn't possibly have known or understood. You're telling me Moses knew the exact order of creation? How did he know that? He wrote it years and years after it happened. It wasn't as if he was sitting there watching it happen and wrote it down. Where do people think he got that information? From those crazy Egyptians? It's amazing. I asked that same guy, when did they discover that the earth is suspended in space, that it hangs on nothing? He said, well, 1600s or so, and I was surprised. I said, yeah, around 1600s. I said, well, the Bible tells us that, and it was written hundreds and hundreds of years before that. How did the guy who wrote, wrote that know that? And he said, the Bible says that? I said, yeah. And he said, I don't know. I'll have to check into that. That's what he said. Not only that, but the earth is round. That was discovered way after Isaiah wrote that. The atmosphere has weight. It wasn't known until the 17th century. The stars can't be counted. There's... Mountains and canyons in the seas. There's all kinds of things like that in the Bible that are scientifically accurate. To do all that and have it all fit together perfectly, there had to be one mind behind it all. It had to be the mind of God. Okay, turn to Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So here we're told, first of all, how we did not get the Bible. Right? By the will of men. It didn't come from guys just wanting to make things up about God. It came from God. It came from holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Not only that, but over and over again throughout the Bible, we're told that it is God speaking, that he spoke the exact word. 2 Samuel 23 says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Let me get Jeremiah 1 says, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go... To all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And then in First, First Thessalonians, the New Testament, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So the writers said it was God giving them the words. They weren't taking credit for it, were they? And then what did Jesus say? Let's slip over to Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse 25. Then he s- Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He never went around telling people that's an unfortunate rendering. He never said, yeah, but in the originals. He never questioned or corrected what was written. Didn't he have the utmost and unwavering confidence in them? And he wanted everybody else to have that same confidence. Why? Because people's eternities depend on it. What are you and I staking our soul on? God's Word being absolutely perfect. That's what we're staking it on. And then once those inspired scriptures were given, we're told in John that they could not be broken. We're told in Matthew that they are exact down to the letter. And we're told in 1 Peter that they would abide forever. Now that's not possible if it wasn't perfect. It's not possible if it didn't come from God. And then the Bible, of course, 
stands alone and it stands supreme when it comes to one of the greatest tests of any book or any religion, and that's the ability to predict the future. Prophecy. Other books can't do it. The Bible's full of amazingly accurate prophecies. We're not going to look at a lot of these, but there's many prophecies dealing with the nation of Israel. It would become a great nation. They would spend 400 years in Egypt, 70 in Babylon. They'd be scattered among the nations. They would reject their Messiah. There's prophecies concerning um, Gentile nations, specific cities, individuals. And, of course, there's the amazing prophecies of Jesus' earthly ministry, of which he fulfilled every one. How he would be born, where he would be born, what he would be called, the fact that he would have a forerunner, the fact that he would be rejected by his own, details about his rejection and crucifixion. The only explanation for that is it's the Word of God, something no other book can claim. All right? What else makes the Bible divine, supernatural book? Well, the symbols that are used for the Bible are a remarkable thing done by God because of what they teach and what they reveal and what they provide for us. Look at James chapter 1. We'll just look at each one of these quickly. First of all, it's a mirror. James 1 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the Bible as a mirror does something that no other book can do. It reveals the mind of God, but it also reveals the true condition of man. It looks right past the facade, right past all the phoniness, right past all that false bravado, and reveals exactly who and what we are. It just leaves us wide open and naked before God with nothing to hide behind. And that's why most people don't want anything to do with it. They know it's going to reveal something. It's not going to be good. But that's what we need. That's why we need to be checking this mirror all the time. All right, it's a seed. Turn to Luke 8. We saw already that the Bible said being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Luke 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Simple, straightforward verse. So as the living word, it regenerates us. That's how we're born again. That's how we're saved. And once that seed is properly planted, what does it do? It brings forth life, it brings forth growth and fruit, but then it becomes our responsibility to sow that seed, whether we want to or not, whether we think it's worth it or not, whether we think the time is right or not, it's our responsibility to sow it. Okay, next, it's a light or a lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Everywhere is darkness. We start out in darkness, our hearts are darkened, we live in a world of darkness, people are controlled by darkness, darkness has blinded people's eyes, and that darkness is eventually going to lead them into a place of outer darkness where they will spend eternity with a beast who has a kingdom full of darkness. And and that's the destination of everybody. And in the midst of all that darkness, God has given us a perfect light. Thy word is a light. And that light can lead somebody, the person who who seems to be in the deepest darkness and the worst sin, to God if they'll only heed that light and come to Him. And then Ephesians 5, it's water. And it's called water because of its cleansing, quenching, refreshing qualities and abilities. The same book that reveals all my sin and defilement and the fact that I'm dirty shows me how to be clean. The fact that I can be clean with the washing of water 
by the word. The Bible says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Okay, it's a sword. Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's called a sword because of its piercing, convicting ability. What's interesting is we're told in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. All things that are to be worn by the believer. The only offensive piece we have is this. This is our, the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. But you have to know how to use it to be useful. You have an offensive weapon. You want to be skilled. You want to be well-trained in how to use it. And for this weapon, that takes study and prayer and study and prayer. You don't want to be swinging this around out of control. But when it's used the right way, it'll prick somebody's heart. Okay, then we have precious metals, gold and silver. We saw that in Psalm 12. And then the Bible says, Therefore I love thy commandment above gold, yea, above fine gold. And this, of course, is because of the Bible's desirability. Its preciousness, its beauty, its tremendous value. People often chase after and they go after all kinds of different things in the world. Things that as Christians we're often told not to go after and pursue. Some because they're bad and harmful. Some because they're just an absolute waste of time. In the end, they're empty and vain. But what has God done? Don't go after that. Don't go after that. Those people are all doing that. Don't go after In the midst of all that, He gives us this. Something far more valuable. Something far more precious. Something far more enriching. His Word. The Bible says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. That's hard to comprehend. And the church at Smyrna, he said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Okay, last, well, two more. It's, one, it's a hammer. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? It's a hammer because of its ability to both tear down and build up. This thing's strong and powerful. It can break a hard heart. But you're talking to somebody and sometimes you think, it's not doing any good. These people aren't getting it. Giving them God's Word, they're not getting it. Well, that's when that hammer needs to be swung over and over with different kinds, over and over with more blows to break that hard heart. It's a hammer. That happened to the Apostle Paul. Think that was the first time he heard the God's word? Finally it got through and he fell on his face. Okay? Then last one. God's word gives us our essential food, our spiritual nutrients. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3 and Hebrews 5. First Corinthians three and Hebrews five. <clears throat> Our essential food. Most people love to eat. <clears throat> They'll eat just about anything. They don't care. If Brother Bob Perel put leftovers out there, it would have to be pretty sickening for somebody not to eat it. <clears throat> and then somebody still would. Some Bible school student or something. <clears throat> But we're told from the time we're children to watch what we eat, eat the right things regularly, get a balanced diet, all that stuff. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but we don't consider feeding and taking care of our souls like that, do we? I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Who's done that on a consistent, regular basis? Not many. But that's God's desire. That's the kind of mindset he wants us to have. And look what he's done. Look what he's given us and provides as a diet for us. Throughout the Bible, we see it as meat. We see it as milk. We see it as bread. We even see it as honey, showing us that God's Word's not plain. It's not bland and dull, but it's full of sweet things. But it's interesting. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. So here's people, they get milk because they're not ready for solid food. 
And that's the beauty of God's Word. Parts of it are simple enough for a child or a young Christian to get it. But then look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of Use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So these people, they're still in need of milk, though they should be ready for some meat. Right? They should be ready for some solid food. Why aren't they? They're not taking God's word serious enough. It's on the back burner somewhere. They're not going after it. They have teeth. They should be ready for it now. It's time to get off the milk and get on the meat. And they're not ready. They're negligent. And that's the same today. Too many people are filled up with junk food. They're devouring and chowing down on everything but the Bible. People know all kinds of stuff about weird, goofy things, and they know practically nothing about the Bible. That's a travesty. All right. Here's another example of why the Bible is a remarkably divine book. We saw from 1 Peter and Hebrews that the Word of God is a living book. We know from Revelation 19 that Jesus' name is called the Word of God. This is neat. Let's look at the relation between Jesus as the living Word and the written Word, the Scriptures. Look how God views His Word, how these things line up. Looking at the relation between Jesus as the living Word and the written word, the scriptures. First of all, they're both eternal. It's said of Jesus, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. It's said of the Bible, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. They both have a human and a divine aspect to them. Jesus, God was manifest in the flesh. It's said of the Bible, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They're both perfect. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's said of the Bible, the law of the Lord is perfect. Every word of God is pure. They're both sources of life. Jesus said, I am the way, the life, the truth and life. The said of the Bible, being born again out of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. They're both light. We saw that. They're both truth. Both must be received for a person to be saved. To as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. And of the Bible it says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. They're both despised and rejected by the natural man. He is despised and rejected of men, Isaiah 53 says. And of the Bible, Full well you reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And in the last one, Both will judge the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. The word that I have spoken, it says of the Bible, the same shall judge him in the last day. That's really remarkable, isn't it? How those things line up. God did that. All right, something else that shows that the Bible couldn't have been written by men. These are things that I really enjoy, and that is pictures and types. We see how how one thing lines up with and matches and shows us something else, and there are many all kinds in the Bible that we could look at. But we're going to look at one that, that fits our topic of the Word of God. And that's the manna. The manna that God sent the Israelites in the wilderness. That's a type of the Word of God. It's a type of our spiritual food. Turn to Exodus 16. Can you imagine trying to lead all these people through the wilderness? I mean, you can't bring 30 people somewhere for four days without there being difficulties. Seriously. So Moses knew what it would require. That of leadership and diligence and commitment and all that. 
But most of all, he knew it would require God. God working and God leading and guiding and God providing. Providing not just sometimes when things got really bad, but every day and every step of the way would require God or they wouldn't make it. They would die out there. And this is what God did with that manna, with their food. Look at verse 4, chapter 16 in Exodus. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now this after, this is after their horrible, if you look at the first two, two, first two verses, this is after their horrible, ungrateful, selfish, brat attitudes and mistrust. After that, he said he would rain bread down. Not send a few pieces here and there. It would be raining bread. There would be plenty of it. So this manna, it's a beautiful type of God's word. And we're just going to look at a few. First of all, it was a miraculous gift from heaven. Look at verse 4 again. Then said the Lord to Moses, I will rain bread from heaven. It wasn't something the Israelites produced. It wasn't something they brought with them from Egypt. They didn't have stockpiles of it laying around to get them through their journey. They got it from God. God gave it to them. The end of verse 15, look what it says. This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. And this Bible has been miraculously given to us, hasn't it? It was a gift. It wasn't produced by men. It wasn't brought forth from the minds of men. It came down from heaven, and it's the mind of God. Amen. And then that manna, we'll throw it in there, it's a picture of Jesus Christ, too. He wasn't of the earth. He was from heaven. And just as that manna was a gift, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, two, the manna was white. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Why are we told what color it was? Well, it matches God's word. White is a, it's a symbol or an emblem of purity. And what does the Bible say about God's word? The words of the Lord are pure words. Every word of God is pure. Why is it called the Holy Bible, the Holy Scriptures? Because they're absolutely perfect and pure. Amen. And of course, Jesus Christ was perfect and pure too, the lamb without blemish, without spot, with no sin. All right, then the manna was obviously to be eaten. It was to meet their physical need. And the Bible meets our spiritual need. The question we have to ask is, are we feeding on it enough? Are we getting that balanced diet from them? And then you know how long the children of Israel, how often, I should say, the children of Israel had to gather that manna? Look at verse 4. Daily, except, of course, when preparing for the Sabbath. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Now that's telling us something. They needed new manna each day. They couldn't live off what they ate a week ago. But why do we think we can do that with the Bible? See, I don't care how much we ate tonight. Tomorrow at this time, we're going to be hungry. We just are. Some people will be starving. And what we will do is we will feed our flesh again and again. And we need to remember to feed our souls over and over and over, day after day after day. That's why it's a picture. That's why it's a type. Okay? They had to gather it in the morning. Look at verse 14. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And then verse 21. And they gathered it every morning. Every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Another good list lesson. Making time to put what's most important and valuable first. After the activities of the day and the busyness get going, they put what's most important first. Even if it's a few minutes. 
meditating, memorizing a verse, we'd be feeding our souls. We wouldn't be giving God's word second place. Early will I seek thee. And then it took effort to get it. Verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more and some less. So they had to go out and get it. They had to work. Now, they didn't have to work to bring it about. They didn't have to work to get it from God, but they did have to work to gather what was given to them. They had to get up, get out there, and get it. Or it melted. And we're told to to do what? We're told to read and to search and to seek and to study. And that takes time. That takes effort. That takes diligence and that takes work. God didn't, didn't shove it down their throat and make them eat it. They had to take some initiative and go after it. We're told to go after it as hid treasures to get the wisdom and understanding we need. Okay, and finally, the manna never ran out. God just kept giving it and giving it until they reached their destination. Look at verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did, it, they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Thank God that's true of our spiritual bread. The word of our God shall stand forever. Thank God it's true of our Savior. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that something? Some guy made all that up. He lined it all up, made it all fit just perfect together. He did that. All right, here's something else about the Bible. This is neat. Turn to Psalm 118, Genesis 1, and Revelation 22. Psalm 118, Genesis 1, Revelation 22. Psalm 118, 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. That's the exact middle verse in our Bible, and it's about the Lord. And that's incredible, but there's a couple neat things about that. Not only is it the center verse, and it's about the Lord, but the center two words are the Lord. There's 14 words in that verse, and you can't get a center word. You have to get two center words, and they're the Lord. And then look at Genesis 1. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven... And the earth. So here the Bible begins with God, which of course is the essential starting point. Then look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Here the Bible ends with man the last of God's creation. And we know the Bible is God's word to man, and its purpose is to reconcile, to bring man back to God, and that's exactly what we have in the middle verse of the Bible. God telling us to forget about trusting man and trust him, knowing full well that that's what our tendency would be, to get our eyes off him and on somebody else, and the exact middle verse is about that. And then look at Genesis 3. Keep, your, keep, keep Revelation 22. Probably already lost it. Genesis 3.10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. And I hid myself. This is the first time that man says something to God. 
It's the first recorded words to God. I was afraid. I hid myself. That's an absolute shame. There's the result of sin. Then look at Revelation 22. Verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Here we have the last words of man to God. Even so, come Lord Jesus. There's the result of grace, mercy, redemption. No more being afraid. No more hiding from God. But now there's anticipation and there's a desire to see Him. First and last. How God puts that in there. All right, one more thing quickly that shows the Bible can't be anything but God's Word. Throughout the Bible, we see the Trinity. We are a Trinity. Spirit, soul, and body. David showed us that a few weeks ago. We have to constantly contend with the Trinity of evil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We struggle with the Trinity within us. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's interesting that it's those three things that the devil used to tempt Eve and Jesus. You look at that tree. It was good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. One to make one wise, pride of life. What did he say to Jesus? Command these stones and made bread. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Cast thyself down hence. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. But here's the key to it. It ties in with with the word of God. Eve was defeated. She failed and fell because she disregarded and doubted God's word. Jesus had victory because he used and trusted God's word. It is written, compared to yea, hath God said. So so victory or defeat depends on the place that we give God's word. It's neat how that stuff matches the lines up. And then we have seen the Trinity before when God said, let us, in Genesis, make man. He uses us to show us the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, early in those chapters of Genesis, you know how many times he uses us in referring to the Trinity? Not two, not four, three. Once in relation to the creation of man, let us make man. One in relation to the fall of man, behold, the man has become as one of us. And one in relation to the judgment of man, let us go down there and confound their language. Isn't that fascinating? And that's not even a sliver of what's in the Bible. These people who question and criticize it, they think we're, we're crazy and out of our minds for, for believing it. What book do they have to replace it with? Give me a book that you want me to read instead. That you want me to trust instead. What other book has had a more powerful, life-changing influence on people's lives? People from all over the world. From lowly, unknown, poor people to highly esteemed, highly regarded, rich people. Where is that book? Where is the book that has led more people to give up prominent careers prosperous lives, ones of prosperity and ease and wealth and security, to go to the ends of the world, unknown lands, places they know nothing about with undesirable people, just to tell them what it says. Where is that book? Where is the book that's had more people willing to die to stand for its truth? People where all they had to do to not be tortured and killed was recant. All they had to do was say, okay, I don't believe that anymore. I won't go there anymore. I won't say that anymore. And they could have gone free. They could have gone on with their lives. But instead, they held their position. They didn't sell out God, and they didn't sell out God's word, and they paid the price heavily because some of them were put on racks and had their bodies pulled apart, their bones broken and dislocated. Some of them had their tongues cut out. Some had their children taken from them. Some were cast into rivers and drowned to death. Others were tied to stakes and thrown in fires to burn to death. For what? For this book? Here's the book they did that for. Do you have something to replace it with? And then we have the average American who has several of these. 
And if they wanted to, they could read it in their front yard laying in a hammock, and they don't. And then we have this guy, and many like him. After ten days, Mr. Chin arrived home. His wife and daughter greeted him with a sigh of relief. If his neighbors even suspected that he had traveled outside the country, they would tell the authorities and Mr. Chin would be locked away in a labor camp, probably for life. Mr. Chin's wife knew the danger of the item her husband brought home. After waiting for the cover of darkness, Mr. Chin carefully wrapped the item he had smuggled from China and buried it in the yard outside his small two-room home. This was the fourth time he had accomplished this risky task in the last four years, and he prayed that God would grant him at least two more successful trips. Buried in, men, in, buried in Mr. Chin's yard are copies of the most dangerous book in North Korea, the Holy Bible. To confess belief in God or to own or even read a Bible was to ask to be sent to prison. If someone is arrested for carrying Bibles, he's considered a political prisoner and will possibly even be executed. The trial procedures for those people are not open to the public. There's no notice. They just disappear. Here's a guy taking that risk in order to have the truth of the Bible. He's willing to go through that for the Bible. And you think after all that, I'm going to question the Bible because some guy who can't quote ten verses of it criticized it? No, the only thing I'm going to question is me. Have I spent enough time reading and studying it? Have I spent enough time reading and teaching it to my children? I'm going to question the time I wasted when I could have been reading it. The reason Mr. Chin and those martyrs went through what they did is because this is a life-changing book. And it's a life-changing book because it's a living book. And it's a living book because it's the Word of God. And we have to constantly ask ourselves, does it have the proper place in my life? Am I giving it enough attention and a high enough priority? And of course, could I do better? Could I do better? Let's pray. Lord, we're sure grateful that you've given us your word. We're grateful for showing us the truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us to desire it above anything else. Please help us to get that desire and to remember who we're living for. In Jesus' name, amen.